Hello. Hi. Hi, professor. Hello. Buongiorno. Ah, c'è Chiara. Buongiorno. Oh, ok. Ah, I'm coming. Let me Anywhere. send. Here we are. Ah, 16, 18. Okay. So let me send um, for Ricardo's email and he will oh. give you access to the folder directly. Oh, okay. Okay. So uh -huh. did you find the place with the material? Was uh, yes, yes. Uh, on no? you, on the Dropbox, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Did you so, find it? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Sounds yes. great. So uh, um, he said as there, you there said, was there was just two files, yeah. Yeah, he updated it. He updated it. There was one, one folders with I think three files. Yes, there is also a general that. chapter from the okay. new manual of seismological observatory practice that maybe <coughs> was also to get some extra information. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's true. Three, it's true? No, no, yeah. I'm just telling you because I don't have a good control of the Dropbox. I just yeah, yeah, like yeah. it, so yeah, I, just, I can I have just, made some mistake. It's not yeah, I just mistake. saw it. I just saw it now. Okay, sounds great. So are we all here? Should I start uh, loading uh, the lecture? Okay. Um, I have yeah. sent um, Prof. Ricardo's email to the group at the chat. So um, if you email him, he'll give you access to the folder. Okay, I check it. So who is okay. interested as to as have to ask you, okay? <laughs> mm. You are the boss. <laughs> Just trying to move the window. Okay, I will load my screen. Let's see if I manage. Okay. Can we start? Is it fine for you? Yeah? Yes. yes. Okay, just trying to manage with virtual machine and my machine should work. I hope it's not working. Okay. Okay. Do you remember what we talked about uh, last time? We totally forgot. No. So we started uh, last time. Ah, okay. Tell me. Uh, I have, we first discussed about the vertical and horizontal component uh, amplification, and mm -hmm. then we we discussed a case study in which we have a different a bit, in difference between the amplification between because we assume that uh, there is no amplification in the vertical component, mm -hmm. but but we found that there is a, a case where we have a amplification that mm -hmm. amplify the horizontal component. And then we move to towards the uh, case and move towards the noise data where we use the noise data for, for further analysis. And we were over there. Okay. So, and we start with some of the example of a noise analysis. And um, today we will go to discuss uh, a method that has been, has become very popular in the last, you know, I would say, 30 years, that is the horizontal to vertical spectral ratio, similar to what we have seen uh, last time for earthquakes, but uh, applied uh, to seismic noise. Please, and uh, <clears throat> for, for those who have not uh, muted their microphone, they should do it because we are listening uh, some noises. OK. I will try again, and if there is some noise, okay, you can interrupt me again, okay? So, as I mentioned, is a very similar, but as we will see, the uh, theory, let's say, the background, how the things are working, is uh, quite different uh, with respect to the horizontal vertical uh, ratio for, uh, for earthquakes. So 
the first idea of uh, start using the H over V, let's say, uh, is generally um, related uh, to the paper of uh, Nakamura in 1989. In reality, some attempts of, uh, or some proposal of using this uh, H over V as a sort of uh, indicator of a resonance frequency of a site uh, had been already introduced uh, at the beginning of the uh, 70s, so now 50 years ago, by two um, Japanese uh, uh, scientists, Nogoshi and Igarashi, and they were uh, showing that the ratio between uh, the horizontal and the vertical spectrum of uh, seismic noise was uh, in some way related to the ellipticity of Rayleigh waves. So if you remember Rayleigh waves, uh, they are polarized uh, in elliptical way. So it means that the particle motion is elliptical and uh, this ellipse is polarized in the direction on a plane, which is uh, radial to the direction of propagation of waves. So the ratio between the horizontal and the vertical motion is in some way a proxy. Uh, it's related to uh, the ellipticity. So how much is elliptical the motion at each frequency in your spectrum? And uh, they also show that uh, since the lowest maximum of this ellipticity uh, coincide with the resonance frequency of the site, so they su you, uh, suggest to use the H over V spectra ratio as an indicator of the underground structure. So you can also see it in this way. When we have, uh, the idea is that mainly seismic noise, like we also discussed last time, is mainly made of surface waves. And especially on the vertical components, surface waves can be mainly only, only, let's say, Rayleigh waves. So if you start from this assumption, um, depending on the underground structure, each frequency will have a different polarization. So a different shape of ellipse. Why? Because different frequencies will have different wavelength. You remember the wavelength depends on the velocity divided the frequency. So generally low frequency have low, long wavelength. They go deeper in the earth. So they see a different structure than the high frequency because the high frequency are related to a shallow velocity, a shell near surface velocity, which is smaller. They are related to high frequency and therefore the wavelength is small. And so the, the part of the underground that is seen, let's say, by the surface waves, in this case, by these high frequency surface waves is only the shallow part. So since the structure is different, also the way these waves will be polarized, so the ellipse can change depending on the frequency. If we have a frequency which is uh, close, uh, uh, that can reach nearly the bedrock, where I have a major impedance contrast, you remember from the first lecture between the sediments, let's say, and the stiff and high velocity bedrock, what is happening is happening that these low frequencies start to be polarized nearly horizontally. So it means that the motion is mainly only on the radial component nearly becoming negligible or nearly null on the vertical component. So if we take H divided V, we will have a certainly a peak because the denominator is becoming very small. So the ax of the ellipse is becoming nearly zero. So this tend to give you a very large peak. And these uh, two scientists, they show that uh, this peak related to the frequency that sees the large impedance contrast is very close to the resonance frequency for the propagation of shear waves. So this H over V of noise in some way is showing a peak very close to the peak of the resonance frequency of shear waves, but was due in their opinion, maybe mainly to ellipticity or Rayleigh waves. So a sort of coincidence. This study was made mainly in Japanese, was, sorry, was in Japanese. So unfortunately didn't get a lot of uh, 
uh, how can I say, advertisement was not, uh, didn't become popular, especially in the uh, Western community, unfortunately. But then in 1989, uh, Nakamura made this uh, method of using the H over the spectral ratio of uh, seismic noise, again, uh, quite uh, popular because he published uh, especially on, uh, in, uh, in English, but he also made a different assumption. So he was stating, and he's still suggesting that the H over V spectral ratio is a readable estimation of a site response. So you see immediately the difference. In the original method, H over V is mainly able to provide you an estimation of a resonance frequency. For Nakamura, it's not only doing this, but can provide you the whole site response. The same that we calculate for uh, earthquakes and for the standard spectral ratio, for example. You can imagine that this made uh, uh, create a lot of attention around uh, this, uh, this method, because if this would be true, we would need uh, just a few uh, minutes, let's say, maybe also 20, 30, 40 minutes of simply seismic noise in a place. And from a simple calculation of the horizontal component and vertical component Fourier spectrum, we could easily, from their ratio, calculate the uh, site response. From that moment on, there was uh, plenty of studies trying to check uh, if this was true making comparison, especially with uh, earthquake data, and also many studies trying to understand what could be the limitation due to the signal analysis, due to the kind of sensor that was used, because in this case we are using or considering very small uh, oscillation of the earth simply due to noise and not to an earthquake. So the main difference that you, I want to stress again here is that the Nogoshi interpretation of a method is mainly based on surface waves. And this is generally still now the preferred interpretation of the method. And that the H over V is mainly related to ellipticity of Rayleigh waves. And then that the ellipticity is frequency dependent. So every frequency in my signal, as I told you before, can have a different uh, ellipticity and exhibit a sharp peak around the fundamental frequency of the site if the impedance contrast is enough high. Generally, especially for impedance contrast larger than 2, 2.5. In this case, different from the transfer function for the shear waves, then you observe a peak in the ratio, not because uh, the horizontal component is increasing due to the multi-reflection, but you observe a peak in the ratio because the vertical component, so your denominator of the ratio, is becoming small. So there is a complete different meaning but a similar results. So this is an example of a paper that was published in 1998 by Conor Homachi that uh, made some uh, theoretical estimation for a simple uh, underground structure of ellipticity of Rayleigh waves. So what they show, for example, is that uh, if they consider different modes of propagation, this is the first mode, then the second mode, and so on. So if they consider the ellipticity of different modes, spanning a different bandwidth, what they observe is that close to the resonance frequency of the site, there is a clear peak mainly related, mainly we will see it's not only the case, of a fundamental mode, but at higher frequency, we can have both trough and peaks, for example, for example here. And this coincidence of trough and peaks due to the higher modes is what is making the final ratio having only nearly one peak and nearly a flat value for the higher frequencies. They also made uh, some comparison between the ellipticity. You see here, for example, a station number two 
This is the ellipticity for radio waves with dashed lines. In black line, you have a H over V ratio that was observed in the field. And with this black line with several peak, you have the S wave side effects. Be careful, this figure is uh, turned. These are high frequencies, so short period. And this is the low frequency, so uh, long period. So what you immediately see is that where you have a peak in the H over V, you have also a peak in the ellipticity and the peak in the 1D transfer function of the medium. But at higher frequency, the H over V, it's quite different from the ellipticity or a single ellipticity and from the single uh, and from the shear wave transfer function. So in principle, what we see here is that the H of shows only a peak corresponding to the lowest frequency. And this peak correspond quite well to the lowest frequency uh, H over V peak due to the ellipticity of radio waves. So there was a good coincidence between this theory of Rayleigh waves and the observation of micro of uh, seismic noise from the field. They also made some attempt to check if the amplitude of this peak from the Nakamura method was uh, similar to the amplitude of the uh, of shear waves site uh, response, at least of the fundamental frequency. And uh, they observed that, uh, okay, they were quite optimistic in this, but in general, as you see here, there is no a clear good agreement between the peak in the Rayleigh wave ellipticity and the one from shear waves. So the difference can be also quite large. And this also is putting a, a big question mark. We said that ellipticity of Rayleigh waves tends to go to infinitive, because if the impedance contrast is large, the particle motion of the waves is on the horizontal, and therefore the vertical component is becoming zero. So if you take the ratio, this will go nearly to infinitive. And therefore, this is putting a question mark if it can be really used as an indicator of amplification at one side. Another important part uh, of the Konomachi paper is that they also show how the peak that is in the ellipticity can change amplitude depending on the smoothing of the spectra. So I told you already last time when we saw some of these uh, spectra calculation that generally when we calculate the spectrum, then we smooth the spectrum a little bit in order to avoid very large variation, especially in the ratio of the spectra. And they also show that smoothing the spectra with different uh, methods, for example, here you have two peaks nearly going to infinitive, using fixed bandwidth windows from the high frequency to the low could change the ratio of the amplitude. They also propose another method to um, smooth the spectra that was able in the high and low frequency range to keep constant the ratio of the amplitude. But you see still the effect of smoothing can be important not only on the amplitude, but also in the position of the peak. So the problem could be if you smooth too much your spectrum with this parameter B equal to 10 in this case, you can also shift the position of a peak and therefore make an estimation of the resonance frequency at the site. So the question then continuing over many years, especially in the year 2000s, there has been several projects dealing with this uh, issue of uh, Nakamura method, and some questions arrive, arises. So one question was, are only Rayleigh waves determining the shape of H over V? I mean, seismic noise, we have said, uh, is the wave field 
which is uh, generated by many random sources around the site that can come from very far away, like sources in the ocean for the low frequency, to high frequencies generated by anthropic sources. So are these sources only generating Rayleigh waves and are only Rayleigh waves determining the shape of the H over V? As I mentioned last time, when we have a source, we always generate body and surface waves. But the body waves attenuate much faster when I go far away from the site. So if I'm from the source, so if I am enough far away, let's say from my source, my wave field will be mainly dominated by surface waves. But of course, surface waves are not only Rayleigh waves. So there could be also some portion in the wave field that we analyze, of course, of love waves. The main problem that one wants to address is generally is how much love and how much Rayleigh waves we have in the wave field. And uh, this is a really a big uh, important point because, for example, I would like to be able to generate a synthetic H over, v, H over V in order that, for example, I can try to make an inversion, as we will see later, of H over V to retrieve the underground structure that was able in the real data to generate that H over V. If I want to, to do this, I, it means I should be able to generate also some synthetics H over V. So generally when uh, inversion were made, uh, one of the assumptions was to consider the rates between love and Rayleigh wave as a frequency independent. So 50 p 50, let's say, or just assume that at each frequency have as much or a certain amount of love and Rayleigh waves that was fixed, independent on the frequency in some cases to a fixed value uh, that could be root square of two and so on. Another assumption that can be also made is that the ratio between the horizontal and vertical forces, so the sources generating waves that then are part of this uh, seismic noise wave field, uh, we have are more or less the same so that we have as many vertical as many horizontal sources in a statistical sense. In this case, the ratio in the wave field that you will obtain between love and Rayleigh wave, it's not constant, but depends on the frequency. And this is because the transfer function of the medium, it's different for each frequency for love and for Rayleigh waves. So this assumption generally are used when we want to try to generate synthetics H over V in order to see if we can really use them to retrieve the underground structure. Other methods have been also developed working on the polarization of a signal, trying always to extract these two contribution. The important part is exactly what is written in the last sentence. The frequency dependency of love and Rayleigh wave that we observe on the different component is related to the green function of the medium. So it means, you can see it in this way, that rainy and love waves are sensitive in a different way to the underground. So if we can extract both, then probably we can use this information to better constrain the velocity in the underground structure data. In the original version of Nakamura, Nakamura, as I mentioned, was saying, okay, something completely different from what I told you, that is the most accepted um, idea behind the Nakamura method. So the original, that is due to surface waves analysis. Nakamura, it's mainly assuming that surface waves are nearly eliminated in the spectral ratio. And therefore, that the H over V is only related to the ratio between the S waves and therefore to the S wave transfer function. 
the main assumption made by Nakamura are that the vertical component is not amplified at the fundamental resonance frequency. Okay, this could be a reasonable assumption. Uh, if you think also to the H over V for SH waves that we have uh, discussed last time, we have seen that the vertical component amplification is mainly happening at frequency higher than the fundamental one. Then an assumption is that the H over V on rock is nearly equal to one, which is uh, uh, something that generally is verified by the data. You remember when I show you also the H over V at the rock site in Gubbio, this was nearly flat on the site that we were using as a reference. Then Nakamura was defining a ratio that he called B between surface and body waves. So the ratio between how much surface and body waves I have in the vertical noise wave field. And generally saying is much smaller than one. So it means we have a much less surface wave in the vertical component than body waves. And finally is assuming that the product of this ratio, which is very small, and the H over V ratio due only to surface wave is much smaller than the true transfer function of the medium. Well, as I said, it's a very it's reasonable to consider that the point one and true and two can be accepted based also on simple experience from the analysis of the field data. However, there is some, uh, let's say, contradiction in accepting together point number three and point number four. So point number three, assuming that the vertical component is becoming, uh, it's a, uh, on the vertical component of the surface waves are much smaller than the body wave. This is true also following Konomahachi and the other results when we have high impedance contrast. So we have a small vertical component close to the reference uh, resonance frequency. But if this is becoming very small, the ellipticity is going to infinitive. So if it's going to infinitive, then when we multiply this for the factor B, this cannot be a very small number. So there is still some uh, uh, contradiction in the, or some lack of clearness uh, in the proposal of Nakamura. And nowadays, most of the studies after a large analysis of a seismic noise wave field with large arrays, with many data, most, uh, let's say of a, uh, results are showing that uh, seismic noise is mainly constituted by surface waves. Also, in some part of the spectrum, especially where the vertical component, for example, of the Rayleigh waves is becoming small, the contribution also of body waves cannot be ruled out and should be considered. Other efforts have been done in comparing if the resonance frequency obtained with Nakamura is consistent with the resonance frequency obtained, for example, by standard spectral rate analysis of generalized inversion technique. These are just some examples showing you that both the noise H over V and the earthquake H over V are providing a good estimation of the resonance frequency. But when we come to the comparison of the amplitude of the resonance frequency in the H over V or in JIT or uh, in the earthquake H over V, we see that there is some discrepancy. Other studies also quite 20 years old. So these things have been massively uh, studied at that time, but also in the following time with larger data set. But already these previous studies were able to show that the resonance frequency of noise and the reference frequency for an earthquake standard spectral ratio in different areas of the world were always providing quite good uh, and similar results. But uh, where the amplitude, for example, 
the amplitude of the resonance frequency of noise and the amplitude of the standard spectral ratio were completely different. So the noise, you see it here, was generally underestimating the amplification of, uh, of uh, the resonance frequency at the site, the amplification of the shear waves. Another important point is that uh, I mentioned last time that the analysis of the spectra can be dangerous because if you remember, especially in the high frequency range, there could be some uh, narrow band uh, frequency noise that is due to, um, to industrial noise. And this noise uh, can be mistaken if you look only at the spectra, if you look at the maximum in the spectra as a sort of resonance uh, frequency of the site. One has to be careful because sometimes if the noise is not similar, industrial noise is not similar on the free component, its signature can also remain in the uh, H over V spectral ratio. And this is just an example. You see, these are the spectra of a vertical and the two with dashed line horizontal component of noise. You see clearly that there is a certain trough on the vertical component. So it's becoming very small, like we would expect from the theory for the Rayleigh waves, close to a point where then from the H over V we get a peak. So the H divided V is giving this peak. Unfortunately, this narrow band peak around two hertz that we know it's a peak related to, um, to industrial noise is not disappearing in the, in the H over V. So one, it's always a good practice when you analyze the H over V not only to make an analysis of the results of the rates, but also to give a look of the spectra, because you would immediately realize that this peak is not natural, but it's coming from industrial noise. And this still mapped inside the H over V. At another side, you have for the low frequency, a very similar behavior, and you see the resonance frequency of the site, again, very similarly to the other side. This is more far away from the source of industrial noise. The free component of noise are very similar and therefore they are completely disappearing in the H over V spectral ratio. Again, note in this case, these were sites with very high impedance contrast, but the H over V is only showing a peak corresponding to the resonance frequency, but there is no information on possible amplification at higher frequencies. So no information on the full site response. A main important point that was studied, sorry, is uh, how much and with which instruments seismic noise should be measured. This was a, a very important issue, especially 15 years ago, because the instruments were still a bit less sensitive than now and so on. And many people was taking measurements of noise with different instruments, measuring velocity or measuring acceleration with different sensitivity. And sometimes the results were not the same. The question was if there was a bias in the results, for example, due to different instruments. The other point is we are measuring seismic noise, so a signal generated by many, many sources. And the question is how much of this signal we have to analyze before our results are becoming reliable and robust enough to be interpreted. As I mentioned, many projects were dedicated to this. I remember also a European project called Sesame. I was working in another initiative and uh, with Matteo Picozzi, we published also some analysis that was not uh, only based on the empirical observation, like for example, Sesame, but more 
on the statistical stability of the estimate of uh, H over V noise. So what we fix, we said, okay, we would like in engineering and seismology, we would like to have a rest uh, to study what are the best, uh, um, the, the best analysis for uh, looking at good results in the 0.1 to 10 Hertz frequency range. And we started then considering different windows lengths of seismic noise and also the duration of a seismic noise signal that we had to consider. We also check what was the best smoothing of the spectrum and the best procedure to follow. The important point is that we show that it was important to analyze for this frequency range time series of signal that were not shorter than 20 to 60 seconds. So we should have at least 20 to 60 second windows and a total of signal, so many of these windows for a total duration of at least 20 minutes, not less. If you have more is of course better, but not less. Many studies in the past were also made with a very limited number of windows, sometimes three or four. And then we also provide suggestion on the smoothing of the spectrum. So using a, a relative bandwidth with, uh, with around the central frequency. And we show, so similar to what proposed by Kono Omachi a few years before, the sort of a log window, that in this case, the H over V was more stable and the dispersion in the results was minimized. So first suggestion, if you have to do these measurements, take at least not less than 20 minutes of noise. And then in your analysis, maybe just divide the windows in 60 or 20 second windows, calculate the FFT, take the H over V ratio, and then stack or just average all the results of the different windows. The other important point, as I mentioned, is the instrument. This is very important because, you know, we go in a field, we have a seismometer, and this seismometer is able to record our signal, even if it's very small. But different seismometers have different technical characteristics. For example, they can have a relatively short period with a frequency, like in this example of one Hertz or two Hertz or 4.5 Hertz. So you see here from this black curve, this black curve is telling you more or less what is the shape of the response of a seismometer. Or you can put it in this way, since the seismometer has also some internal noise, some electrical noise, some thermal noise, this seismometer with one hertz will be able only to record noise which has a spectral amplitude above this black line. You see in this gray area, I'm reporting the low, the, the noise amplitude between the low noise model and the high noise model. So I generally expect that seismic noise is lying in this gray area. So if I go in the field with a seismometer with one hertz, due to the combination of this response, no, it's like a single degree of freedom oscillator and like, uh, and to his internal noise, if I go with this, I know that I can record only noise that will be above the black line. If I go with a two hertz sensor, you see, I will change the area, especially in this part, what I could record before, I will not be able to record it anymore. Because changing the frequency of the sensor, I'm not able, for example, to record the noise anymore in this area. If I use a 4.5 Hertz sensor, geophone, which is used a lot, for example, especially in applied geophysics, you see that the area 
that I'm able to record is diminishing even more. So if in my area, the seismic noise is very low as, a, as an amplitude, which is a, more or less here, my sensor will not be able to record it. And when I do the H over V, I will have mistake in my results. So it's very important before going in the field also to consider which kind of instruments you are using. And you know already what can be the limitation of using the instruments. For example, with a 4.5 Hertz, it's nearly impossible to record noise below 0 0.2 Hertz. And you can record noise below one Hertz only if it is very, very strong. If it's not strong enough, it will be cut, it will be masked by the internal noise of the instrument. And this effect, you can clearly see it on the H over V. So this gray line is the H over V cal using, uh, uh, calculated using recordings from a broadband sensor. Okay, just look until down 0 0.1 Hertz. The dark gray show clearly the H over V form. Below 0 0.1 in this installation, the broadband had some troubles due some, to some tilting of the sensor. But okay, the broadband from 0 0.1 Hertz on is our reference. We can clearly see the peak. Okay, if I use a sensor with uh, one Hertz, I can still retrieve reasonably at least the first part of a peak. If then I use the same sensor and I put some gain, so I increase the signal a little bit, I can nearly retrieve very correctly the peak in the H over V. And you see it here. But if I use a 4.5 Hertz, so like I saw before, without gain, you see I'm not able to record noise anymore and my h over v is resulting to be fully flat so i know that at this site i have a thick sedimentary cover very thick that can give uh, some important amplification because the impedance contrast is large but with a wrong instrument i would observe only h over v flat so i would say okay i have no amplification everything is stiff if I use a sun gain, I could retrieve some part of this, maybe probably assuming a higher frequency of resonance than the real one. And the same, you can see this is just a short period sensor. This is a broadband sensor. They are nearly co-located. And you see from the spectra of many noise recordings that their shape is identical down to 0 0.1, 0 0.2 Hertz. And then the short period sensor, you see this trend. It means that here you are only recording noise of the instruments, no noise of the, no real noise. So if we take the rates of H of review, we see that down to 0 0.1, 0 0.2 Hertz of a short period is still able to reproduce the results of a broadband. And this is also clear from the coherency of the signal. So what is important here, this is a more, let's say, technical hint. Please, if you are doing these measurements that apparently are very simple, because you have to go with a sensor in the field, you place it there. You just record a seismic noise continuously for several minutes then you simply make an analysis of a Fourier transform and the ratio, and then you average. Okay, this is all fine, but you have to be careful to the amount of data that you are using. So enough long duration of a signal, enough large windows for the FFT, but also you have to be very careful in the kind of instruments that you are using when you go in the field. If you use the wrong instruments, the results, as I showed you, can be wrong. So you will always get a result from the recording, but it doesn't mean that the result will be a good one. So you have always to keep 
also the limitation of the measurements in your mind. Okay? Now I show you a few examples of uh, application of this uh, technique. Uh, this is uh, the example of uh, an analysis that we have made 20 years ago in uh, the Cologne basin in, uh, in Germany. In my knowledge, this was the first massive uh, uh, experiment, massive in the sense of a very large number of H over V measurements in, in a place. So we made more than 400 measurements of noise, temporary measurements, starting from the edge of a valley on rock and then moving inside the basin and also where we expected due to the fault system that you see here, that the thickness of the sediment could have been very large. And we also use both short period and the broadband sensors also in order to compare the influence of the instruments, exactly what I told you before. So this was before the study you had seen before. So uh, here we have uh, a very large impedance contrast between the Devonian bedrock and the tertiary and quaternary sediment. And this is clearly seen by the shape of H over V peak that is uh, very well shaped in the different part of the area. It becomes a smaller where you have also very thick sediments. So we are in the uh, western part of the earth fold. Smaller because also due to the very thick uh, sedimentary cover, the impedance contrast tend to diminish because the sedimentary column in average start to have a quite large velocity. But you see quite well this, uh, the position of the peak. Later, we also install a seismological network with several stations in the area, with 40 station, for recording also earthquake and uh, uh, also noise at other sites. And therefore, we were able to compare the H over V <coughs> from, uh, air, uh, from noise that you see in gray with the H over V from local earthquakes. And you see we have points only the frequencies that were showing a high signal to noise ratio. And then with a standard spectral ratio. In general, we observe at least in the frequency that we can, could compare a reasonable agreement between noise and earthquake results. Having so many points in the town, it was a, we were able then to interpolate the resonance frequency at all the points where we measure. And from the interpolation, we could uh, generate the first resonance frequency map of a town where you can clearly see, for example, here that the resonance frequency is high, where we have very thin sediments or rock, and then the resonance frequency is decreasing when we enter in the basin and then there is a jump, clear large jump here where we have a fault system. So the basin is deepening in this direction due to the extensive fault system. Along the profile, we could also, depending on the frequency, have an idea of which buildings could have had the resonance frequency similar to the resonance frequency of the ground. We use a very simple relation that it was generally used for relating the resonance frequency of a building from the number of stories divided 10. And this is mainly, was mainly valid for reinforced concrete structure. This is very important because you remember, we said our building can be seen as a sort of a oscillator that's why we were making also this assumption, remember, of a, a response spectrum, you know, as a sort of oscillator responding to the shaking. Okay, in the, under this consideration, we can think that every building has different frequencies of oscillations. 
And uh, using this equation, you can estimate the frequency of oscillation of a building, the main, the fundamental one, the translational one, depending simply on the number of stories. If your building has a frequency that is coinciding with the frequency of the soil, you will have resonance. And this means that you can have, you can have increase of damage to the structure in case of earthquake. So that's why we are very much interested in estimating the resonance frequency of a site and in comparing this with the resonance frequency of the building structure in the area. Similar operation, we have done it also in other areas, for example, in uh, Istanbul. In Istanbul, we had um, already stations that were installed from the standard network and from the emergency, also for early warning. And also we carried out at nearly 200 sites uh, measurements of, for H over V with uh, uh, using seismic noise. And uh, in this way, we could increase, uh, let's say, spatial resolution for the estimation of the resonance frequency of a, a very large area of Istanbul. This uh, area is the, in particular, we focus on the Western area because uh, in this area is where we observed from the Izmit earthquake, the largest amount of damages. So we wanted to check and to study if also side effects could have had uh, an influence on the uh, damage distribution in the area. Also here, we were able to compare the results of noise with voice obtained by earthquake that are the gray line. And in general, we could confirm again that with seismic noise, we could have a, a reasonable estimation of resonance frequency, but that the amplitude, especially look at here in the high frequency range, of amplification between noise and uh, earthquake could be a quite different. Again, using this tool of having H over V measure at many, <coughs> at many sites, we were able then to produce a resonance frequency map for the area. And you see here that uh, there is a clear area in red, that is mainly the area still on rock and on a carboniferous formation. You can see it from here. If you follow, this is this point. This is the point from the, and then you move in this direction. You see you are just following the carboniferous, so very stiff and very fast material. While where you start having a diminishing of a resonance frequency is where you enter in more recent uh, uh, sedimentary cover and even around here to quaternary and uh, probably low velocity material. This map was also qualitatively compared with a damage map in Istanbul, you see this part red is more or less uh, indicated. Um, it's uh, starting here. So you see this is the top. And here you can draw a line in this direction, even a little bit more, showing all the northern part where you have uh, nearly less damage, while most of the damage is in this uh, southern part with a resonance frequency that is in the range of buildings. Of course, as I told you already, damage is not only related to uh, side effects, but strongly depends on the vulnerability of a structure. So it's important also to consider that uh, some changes in the damage distribution might be related also to changes in the vulnerability of a structure. But as I told you also last time, it was quite impressive to see that the ground shaking was increasing in this direction. 
and therefore we can expect that in this area the damage was mainly due to a combination probably of side effects and vulnerability of the buildings. Another similar approach that you see can be very useful when you work in very large town. This is Santiago de Chile, and where it could be very difficult to, in, to make also measurements or standard geophysics approach to study the basin. Seismic noise can be measured quite, uh, I wouldn't say simply, but it's still feasible to do it. And we did it and we measure seismic noise in many areas of the basin of Santiago. And again, we were able to reproduce a map showing the variation of the resonance frequency within the basin. That is providing again, important information about potential load damage in the different areas. I told you till now that uh, the H over V is uh, only able to estimate the resonance frequency of a site and also can have problems in estimating the amplification. Recently, there were some interesting publications also showing that uh, H over V, if the wave field, the seismic wave fields, noise wave field is diffusive, so there's a very special condition of uh, amplitude of a different mode and distribution of uh, coming of energy, the H over V spectral ratio then can become very similar to the 1D site uh, response, but only in this very specific condition. And under this uh, very specific condition, this uh, property was used to um, utilize H over V directly to estimate the 1D site response for shear waves. Okay, do you have uh, questions about uh, this part? Uh, I have a question about the last slide, the yes. one that you were showing. Can you repeat again what do you mean by diffusive? Huh. Uh, I didn't catch. So it's diffusive in this sense. It means that the wave field should be distributed more or less anisotropy and there should be equipartition of energy between the different modes. So in this case, under this condition, you can show that the wave field, using this condition, you can see that the H over V, the imaginary part, is corresponding to the 1D uh, transfer function of the medium. But first, you have, of course, to check that uh, this condition is true in the wave field. Many studies now are using this uh, approach that is able then uh, uh, to use uh, this uh, similarities between the 1D uh, transfer function and the H over V also to retrieve the underground uh, structure uh, at a certain site. So there are many usage that are now done under this condition. But in my opinion, at least before doing this, uh, uh, one should be sure that the original uh, assumption that is on the diffusivity of the wave field is, uh, is valid. And I hope this is always done because it's a very particular, uh, particular assumption. It's okay, Chiara? Okay, Can okay. I go yeah. ahead? Yeah, 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 grazie. Okay, no, no, it's fine. If anyone has other questions, it's, it's okay. I like also having a pause. <laughs> okay, otherwise I go to the next part. So, can you see now my screen again? Yes. Yes. Okay, but I lost it. Wait a second. <laughs> I, I cannot see it. Uh -huh. Okay. Okay. 
So if you come back to the Cologne case, you no, know, as I told you, we were oh, sorry. Have a very strange window on my screen. Okay, nothing. Okay, if you uh, come back to the Cologne uh, situation again, as I mentioned, we made measurements in different part of the basin. And in this basin, there were uh, many boroughs that has been drilled also for water research or for coal extraction. And uh, what we have done was to compare the thickness of the sediment close uh, to points, thickness that we knew from boroughs, uh, with a resonance frequency that we could measure from uh, H over V measurements. And uh, here you have some example where you have uh, fixed sediments, so 400 meters before reaching the Devonian basement. We had the resonance frequency very clear and in the low frequency range, let's say 0 0.3 hertz. When the thickness of a sediment was decreasing to 200 meter, you can immediately see that the frequency is jumping to higher value, 0 0.7, 0 0.8 hertz. When you have only 23 meters of sediments, then your frequency is in the high frequency range, let's say around the three hertz. So qualitatively, you can immediately see that what we expected already from this very simple relation, no frequency is equal to velocity divided four times the thickness in some way is uh, respected. But it's also true that the velocity is also not constant, is generally increasing uh, with depth, also simply for um, the lithostatic load. So we try to extend this uh, also to a larger number of points. But first we check if this trend that we observe in some boroughs was also similar to the trend in the shape of uh, the basin that we could extract from previous uh, studies about geology. And you immediately see that going, uh, so the frequency is diminishing to the top. You see that when the frequency is diminishing, uh, generally you have a trend in, diminish, uh, in, in uh, increasing in the thickness. And then here, where you have a fault system, there is a clear jump in the resonance frequency going down to 0 0.2 Hertz. And that means a thickness of the sediments even more than a thousand meters. And for us it was very important because in this way we could even map at such a scale where it would be really complicated with standard geophysical studies. We could also map the position of the fault system that in a different geological map was set in, in different places. And as I mentioned, then we look also to many other boroughs where we had information. So these are places where we had boroughs reaching the bedrock and measurements of H over V. And we had the idea, so we, we put the, in a diagram, the frequency versus the thickness of the sediments. And in this way, if you can assume that uh, that the lateral velocity of variation are relatively smooth so that uh, the thickness is increasing but mainly the velocity is only increasing with depth and not so much laterally. So you can try to find uh, a relation that is linking the resonance frequency that you measure not only at these uh, 30 points but at 400 points with the thickness of the sedimentary cover. So this is one kind of relation that is uh, putting together the resonance frequency and the thickness of the sedimentary cover. So since we measure the resonance frequency over the whole area, then that is uh, this map, you remember from before where you can again see very clearly this jump due to the fault system. So applying the equation that we obtained before, it was possible to go from uh, a, a model, a map of resonance frequency to a map 
of sedimentary cover thickness. And this is really a major importance because if we wanted to make the numerical simulation of ground motion, especially for the air fault system, then we had the model of the old basin that we could use for 3D numerical simulation of shaking then to generate synthetic seismogram uh, over uh, for this area. This, of course, it's a major importance. And you see this area is pretty large. So we are talking about uh, 20 per 30 kilometers. And uh, studying sedimentary cover thickness of this amount with standard geophysical methods would have required very long seismic lines and pretty much uh, of energy inside a strongly urbanized area. So we've also a lot of noise or seismic noise that would have uh, reduce the quality of the seismic uh, signal generated by the active source and especially going to this very low frequency would have been very complicated. So we have very simple measurements of noise, each one at one point and making usage of uh, other information. So for example, already existing boroughs, we were able then to use H over V as a sort of exploration tools for obtaining a good uh, um, information about uh, uh, the underground model in the area. We can also do, of course, more. If you remember a few minutes ago, I told you, okay, we would like to know how much love waves and how much uh, Rayleigh wave we have uh, in order to make simulation. Why? Because, of course, we said uh, I'm in a site and I'm recording noise, which is waves coming from many directions from everywhere. So these waves arriving here are keeping a sort of fingerprint of the underground structure below the site. So we said if H over V is related to ellipticity of waves, the ellipticity of radio waves change depending on the underground structure. So the shape of the H over V depends on the underground structure. So what I would like to do, I would like to start from my H over V. So in an inversion procedure, I would like to say, okay, given my H over V, I would like to retrieve the underground structure, which is able to reproduce a similar H over V. And to do this, of course, I have to be able to calculate a synthetic theoretical H over V given a certain underground structure. Is this okay? It's clear? Yes. It's yes. clear. And do you know a little bit about inversion? We will do it probably next time, I was thinking, we, just to understand how this can work. Have you some experience with inversion, for example, in tomography or in other methods? Uh, I have some. It's, like... it's just to know when, when I have to tell you about inversion, if before or after. <laughs> Simply this, don't be shy. No, no. Okay, okay. So I will try to explain this and then we'll see how maybe this is uh, working. Yes. Okay. So. In this way, what we are doing then, just think now to the forward problem. So we have to generate an H over V. So when we consider an H over V, the way we propose, and also together with Arai and Tokimatsu, following his base approach, we assume that uh, uh, I'm here at my site and my noise sources are, let's say, forces acting on the ground that can be randomly horizontal or vertical, which are at least uh, one wavelength far away from my, um, from my point in order to be, let's say, not in near, in near field. So you can then uh, uh, generate uh, for each source uh, as in, uh, as, uh, sorry, a, a source you can generate the potential spectrum due to the combination of these sources. 
and you can calculate the potential spectrum for the Rayleigh waves in the vertical component that is described by this equation. So where you have uh, the medium response, where you have uh, the ratio of uh, modes for different modes and so on. So it's possible, I will not enter into detail, to describe, let's say, the spectra of the wave field in this place as a combination of the signal generated by many horizontal and vertical forces. This wave field is propagated in a medium that we assume to be homogeneous below the side, so that is only changing, laterally homogeneous, so that is only changing with a vertical medium that is described by many layers, each layer with a certain VP velocity, P wave velocity, shear wave velocity, and, uh, uh, sorry, and uh, uh, density, okay? So this is uh, how we describe uh, this, and of course, layers with a certain thickness. So now we are able to generate some synthetic H over V that we can use uh, to change in the inversion procedure this model until when we will not find an H over V that we generate that is fitting our observation. So I have my observation, I make an assumption for the underground and I generate, just imagine in this way, an H over V. If it's not fitting very well the observed H over V, we can change this model so we can change the thickness, we can change the density, we can change the P wave velocity, we can change the shear wave velocity until when we generate a new H over V that best fit my data. And therefore I could assume, okay, now I have a very good description of the underground starting only from the H over V. But there is uh, one problem, is the H over V depending in, in the same way to all the parameters that we have in the underground. So it depends in the similar way on the velocity of shear waves, on the velocity on P waves, on the thickness or on the density. This we can study, for example, in this way. So what we can do? We just make a sensitivity analysis. So just imagine I have uh, a model of the underground. You see this is the model for the shear waves and for the P at the same site. And for this model, I can calculate using the approach of before, a theoretical H over V, which is the H over V for this model. Then I can start modifying, for example, the thickness of the first layer. And then for this different model, I can calculate how much the H over V change. So here is what I'm doing. I'm checking how much the H over V is changing if I change the parameter. So for example, if I slightly change the thickness of a model. And of course, I can do it for all the layers in my model, one, two, three, and four. These curves are telling us for the different periods or the different frequency, how much the H over V is changing if I change the thickness of the layer. And we see that it can change a lot. So the H over V is very sensitive to the thickness of the layers in my original model, and it's not constant. It is sensitive more or less depending on the frequency, how much the frequency see the underground. I can do the same also changing, not the thickness, but for example, I change the P wave velocity and I recalculate the H over V. Surprisingly, I see that even if I change the VP velocity, the H over V does not change, remain nearly constant. 
If I do it for density, also I see a very limited variation only at a particular point. I have only some changes. If I change the shear wave velocity for the different layers, I see that the effect is again very large, like I had for the thickness of a sediment. So what is telling this mean to us? Okay, that in some way, H over V is not sensitive to VP. So I can change the VP as much as I want and the H over V will not change. Or different, I can use whatever H over V I want and uh, I can get whatever VP I want because it's not fixed. Also the density is not so important, but a change in the thickness and the change in shear wave velocity is major importance. So it means with the H over V inversion, I can get information mainly on the shear wave structure and on the thickness of the sediments. I cannot have information on VP and density. Till now, it's all fine. There is only one problem also coming from this figure, if you see, is that the sensitivity of the H of a V to a change in the thickness or in the velocity is very similar. So I have a similar sensitivity to the change in the velocity at this frequency or to the change in the thickness. And this, of course, it's a problem because it means that I have uh, the problem of trade-off. So I could change the velocity, I could change in the same way the thickness, and I will get the same H over V. So I could have infinitive models of the underground, let's say, that are able to reproduce the same H over V. I give you an example here. These are two models of the underground. Of course, it's a little bit extreme when the model is very complicated, it's uh, not so easy. But if you look at here, I just have a, a first model with a velocity of 200 meters per second and the thickness of, uh, of a layer of 10 meters and the bedrock with a shear wave velocity of 800 meters per second. To the right, I have a model with 20 meters, so I'm doubling the thickness, but I also double the velocity in the sedimentary cover and in the bedrock. If for these two models, I calculate the H over V without any smoothing, so this is the theoretical one, I will get two curves that I don't know if you can see. One is the blue curve and one is the green curve. You see they are nearly identical. So just see it on the other way around. If this would be my datum and I wanted to make an H over V inversion, both models, and I can generate many others, making three times the thickness, uh, three times the velocity, and so on, all the models would be able to explain my H over V. So I have clearly a trade-off problem. So it means that if I want to use H over V to make a, a reliable estimation of the underground structure, but then I want to use for numerical simulation of ground motion and site response and so on using some assumption, okay, I have to fix one of the two parameters. So either I, fic, I fix the thickness of the sedimentary cover or I fix independently the velocity. So the thickness of the sedimentary cover, for example, could be obtained by independent geophysical measurements, seismic reflection, or can be obtained by borals where you have, or by gravimetric measurements. And, uh, or you have independent information on the velocity, at least in the shallow part, and then you look for the thickness that is better able to reproduce this data. There are mm -hmm. some other, sorry? Mm -hmm. um, the previous slide. On the graph, I could see only one, one plot, like the green 
To the left or to the right inside? No, on the graph. On the, the graph, right. yes, because they are one above the other. They are identical. Oh, okay. Okay, so it, it's I exactly think. this the point. You okay. have two models, model one and model two, you see here, but the H over V for the two model is the same. Okay. Even if a model is different. And that's exactly one of the problem that we have with H over V inversion. The other, uh, yeah. I have another question mm -hmm. from the previous slide. Uh, yeah, this one. We are using uh, BP and VS, and uh, uh, if we use the ratio of BP and VS, then what sort of result? I mean, it can be changed with, uh, I mean. I mean, if you keep it fixer. Yeah, but uh, like we are using the BP response uh, and the thickness and, and, and uh, the VS response. But if we use, uh, instead of uh, VP or VS, if we use the ratio of VP or VS, then... Yeah, but in your model, you have to fix one of two, right? Yeah. So you cannot fix in a model only VP, VS. You will have to fix uh, VP or VS and VP, VS. You no, need both. Uh, uh, no, I am saying that we are we are if we fix the thickness, and then we yes. change the V, then we change VS or VP from uh, from these models. We change one of them, right? Yes. Uh, I'm saying that instead of the, we are changing VP or VS, if we ch take the ratio of VP and VS in that uh, in that side, then what sort of result? So to see how much it will change. If yeah. you change VPVS, oh, it, it will depend only on the change of VS at that point. So whatever okay. change you are doing, you see it from here, it will be related mainly to the fact that you are changing VS. So we will get the response only due to VS and changes of VS. Exactly, exactly. Okay. VP is not really playing a major role. You can have uh, some role because generally you have to assume that uh, VP is very high because maybe the medium, especially in sediments, is fully saturated. Yeah, yeah. Um, this is a, has some influence and therefore you are changing VS and VP a little bit in, in very extreme cases, let's say. Uh, because in some cases we do not have any factor of liquefaction in, in those sites and someone in some sites yeah. have that response. So, yeah. So the, yeah, yeah, no, I know what you mean. Uh, if you want to have a liquefaction is really a major point uh, and having information on saturation, that's really uh, the most important part. But you see from here that this is not uh, the, the best uh, to check for this uh, value. In reality, another important point is that uh, when you make the inversion generally, you, it's good if you know already the position of the water table independently from other information. So, uh, mm -hmm. and generally you use this information in inversion. That's something that you fix. Um, especially later when you, I will show you that you can also estimate the quality factor. This can have a more effect than that on the velocity. So oh, okay. this is the major point. But here, what you see is that oh, okay. the, the changes are mainly related to the VS changes. But uh, honestly, when you go yeah, to okay. very large value of VP, so like for saturated medium, like 1,500 meter per second, then you start to see some influence on the results, but only when, when it's there. But to retrieve it directly okay. from the inversion is uh, very, 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 very difficult. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. So I would stop here for today. Is there still any question? No question for today. We meet tomorrow, hopefully. Okay. Um, please, I sent um, a message to the chat. I don't know if um, everyone has seen it. Uh, no, sorry, I didn't check the chat where I was uh, uh, talking. I ah, okay. Uh, yeah, I was um, sorry, I was talking. Alex. I couldn't see the chat. I have to remove now this.
uh, soon. Try to see the chat, but uh, ah, for the access to the material, I see it now. Yes, yes. Okay, mm. okay. So people can have the address of Ricardo Farnetti at gmail.com to give you the access to the material in the folder. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so if no other questions, so have a nice evening and see you tomorrow then. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.